I read a story about a man named Andrew Bowen, who is most known as the man who spent 12 months practicing 12 different religions in the year 2011. And he claims to have found peace by the end of it all. So to recap his story, Andrew grew up as a professing Christian during high school and took a really big nosedive into fundamentalism, as he calls it. As a teenager, Andrew was actually very passionate about his faith, so much to the point where he was critical of other religions, and he even once chased a pair of Mormon missionaries down the street when they visited his home to try to convert him. After high school, Andrew met his wife named Heather, and they had two girls. But Andrew's views on God changed when he experienced the tragedy of losing his third child, which made him angry and bitter towards God. In order to find peace and to restore his quote-unquote belief in humanity, Andrew went on a quest to practice 12 different religions, one each month for an entire year, being guided by the religion's respective leaders during that interesting period of his life. So these religions he delved into included Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Sikhism, and others. So the first two weeks were spent just reading on their religious beliefs. And then the last two weeks of the month spent exploring the religious practices and attending the gatherings. So he went everywhere from mosques to temples. And he said that with each religious exposure, he learned something new that made him, quote unquote, a better person. So with Buddhism, for example, Andrew learned how to wash dishes. In Mormonism, Andrew learned about humility and what it means to apologize. In Islam, Andrew learned how much he wasted his life with food and certain activities. From this period, Andrew um, established what's called Project Conversion, which was about bearing hatred and building tolerance. You know, you're going to read um, quite a few different stories like Andrew's, maybe not exactly like this one, but I think some of us can relate or know people who've gone through something like this. They grew up in a household where they had parents of different religious faith. Or maybe you've met people who said that they don't cling to any one religion, but they practice maybe two or three different ones at the same time in order to find their peace and prosperity, as they call it. But the question is not, is not whether these religions bring peace with ourselves, but the more important questions we need to ask ourselves is, does this religion bring us peace with God? Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters. Do we have peace with God? Is it okay to mix two different religious, philosophical you know, ideas and beliefs and thinking that we're going to make it to heaven when we die? This is exactly what Jesus Christ talks about in this passage we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. So that's where you need to be at for today's sermon. So once again, in recapping the Gospel of Luke, this Gospel is one of four Gospels in the New Testament that talks about the life of Christ, a biography speaking about everything from his childhood to his three-year ministry where he was teaching and preaching and healing and to his death on the cross and then to his resurrection. And basically those who believe in Christ will get saved. That's pretty much what the Gospels are about. So last week we were, we were looking about how, remember, Jesus calls Levi the tax collector into ministry. Levi was so happy that he threw this big party at his house. And then there were some party poopers who came named the Pharisees who were just kind of like pointing at Jesus and judging him and everything. So Jesus had to set the record straight. So this week, we're going to see a continuation of that episode when more skeptics try to challenge Jesus about his motives, about his intention. And Jesus was basically telling them that the new covenant, the gospel, cannot mix with the old religious ways. The two cannot mix. Therefore, one has to fully trust in the gospel of Christ in order to be saved. That's really the main point of today's message. So this passage teaches us how the gospel of Christ 
cannot be mixed with the philosophies and practices of other religions. That's really what it's about. So Jesus first illustrates this principle that I'm going to be talking about with the question. So he raises a question to the skeptics, and we see that in verses 33 to 35. So let's look at it together, folks. And I do hope that you have your Bible with you because we don't have a slide shot of the verses up here. And in verse 33, it says, They said to him, The disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. So basically, after Jesus was done kind of answering those Pharisees, we have more people who are trying to question Jesus about his intentions, like I said. So these were the disciples of John the Baptist. You guys remember John the Baptist, right? Oh yeah, this really hardcore preacher who got put into prison by Herod because he challenged his, his ancestral ways. He couldn't be there to defend Jesus. And some of John's disciples were still kind of skeptical about whether he was really the Messiah or you know, what was he doing exactly. So he was, they were saying, we're fasting. We do these religious rituals and even the Pharisees do it, but how come you don't do it? How come your disciples don't do it, Jesus? Do you guys know what fasting is? I think some of us have heard it, right? Fasting is when we go for a period of time without eating, maybe even without drinking as well. So these days when people fast, they do it for more like health reasons. They want to lose weight. But it has a very big religious significance going all the way back, of course, to the Old Testament. So people often fasted in the Old Testament when they were pretty much trying to seek after God. You know, they were mourning over their sin or they were trying to get an answer from God from something that was really urgent or pressing in their lives. Yes, I fasted too. It's not easy, but it's actually very good for the soul at times. So the Pharisees often fasted twice a week, on Mondays and Thursdays. And you know what's very strange that is that it was never actually commanded in the Old Testament. So it was kind of like a ritual that they made up, that they really required other people to follow. And they were offended that Jesus' disciples were not following their tradition, even though it wasn't in the Old Testament. So they were basically saying, we're doing it. We're being pious. How come you guys are not doing it? So it's kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of an example. So in uh, Korean Christianity, there's this uh, unique prayer practice called Tongsang Kido. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But it is a time when a group of Korean Christians would pray aloud and they'll be like, you know, wailing and sometimes even weeping towards God, which happens either during service or during prayer meetings. Now, I'm not saying that this act can't be heartfelt towards God. I mean, of course, it can be genuine. But interestingly, this practice itself is not mentioned in the Bible. So it's, it is a Korean tradition. And this is why it becomes very awkward when Korean uh, churches or pastors or leaders really try to force other people, whether in the leadership or below, to do this practice or else, you know, they're not spiritual or whatever. I've actually heard stories like this before. So this is almost kind of like what's happening with the fasting issue here with these Jews. Because these people were thinking, we need to do these things in order to maintain our salvation. We're trying to work for our righteousness. But remember, Romans chapter 10, verse 3, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. This is what the Jews were doing. They were trying to earn a righteousness that they never had to begin with. Thinking it's okay as long as we get maybe like a 70 or 80 or 90% on the test, we're going to get into heaven. But Jesus is saying it doesn't work that way. He says there's nothing that you can do that gets you into heaven. So that is why he had to challenge them on this belief. But yet, even in this situation, it was kind of weird. So that's why Jesus said this in verse 34. You cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them. 
Can you? So Jesus was basically comparing himself as the groom. And then, of course, we know the Bible says that the church is the bride. But in this situation, it's kind of interesting because he was uh, saying to them, why are you telling these disciples that they have to mourn right now? I'm with them. They should be happy. They should be celebrating. Because when you go to a wedding, you don't want guests who show up who are going to act like they're at a funeral, right? How miserable. You want them to have fun. You want them to eat. You don't want them to be fasting during your wedding. Oh, how inappropriate. But Jesus does say in verse 35, But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. So he's saying, right now when I'm with you, you guys should be happy because Jesus, the Son of God, is actually with you right now. You should have every reason to celebrate. But one day I'm going to be taken away from you. And we know that this did happen actually. After the death, you know, then resurrection and ascension, then you can fast. So the lesson behind this is pretty simple, guys. Are there times in your life where you have these practices, these ideas, these beliefs that are really not in line with Scripture? Like you claim to be a Christian, you claim to live by salvation, by faith, but then you're thinking in your mind, oh, I have to also do these other things in order to be saved or else God is not going to accept me into heaven. You know, I got to do this ritual. I got to do this tradition because that's the reason why I get into heaven. I want to tell you, Jesus is saying, no, that's not the reason why you get into heaven. He says, the reason why you get into heaven is because of what I did, not because of what you do. But yes, sometimes you go out and you talk to people and they think faith is not good enough. They have to follow those Old Testament rituals. They have to follow the practices of the Catholic Church. They have to, you know, do this. They got to do that. They just don't know what the gospel is. It's all like muddied in their head. So that is why he tells us, think about this. This is a question that I'm raising towards you. But you know what? Jesus is going to help us even more with understanding this with point number two. So Jesus illustrates this next with the parable, the parables. He's going to tell us this metaphor, this analogy that shows us what he's trying to talk about. So we see that in the last few verses today, 36 to 39. This says, And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. So his first illustration has to do with clothing. He says, when you have an old piece of clothes that's like all ragged, you know, you have those clothes, right? Where you, you bought it and you washed it so much that it's almost kind of like tearing apart. It has holes in it, you know, like in your socks and maybe your shirt and everything. So he's saying it's not a wise idea to try to get a new piece of garment. Like you cut it out and you try to stitch it to cover the holes. Because what happens is when you wash it, whether it's in a washing machine or by itself, he says the, the new piece will shrink and then it will tear away from the old piece and it will just look very ugly. So what was Jesus trying to get at here? It's pretty simple. He's saying you cannot mix works-based religion with a religion of faith because it's just going to mess up both of them. That's basically what he's trying to say. He's saying that I didn't come in order to patch the gospel onto the you know, Old Testament practices or onto like uh, any of the traditions that you guys made up. He says it's not going to work. He says the gospel is something completely new that I brought in. It's a completely new thing. Of course, it's a continuation of the message from the Old Testament. But you know, like all those religious dietary restrictions in the Old Testament, he says it's over because it, it pointed to Christ. He says now you pretty much live by Faith in Christ. I've, I've been telling you this week after week. We need Christ because when we sin against God, our righteousness doesn't mean anything to God anymore. I mean, unless you were able to live a perfectly righteous life from the time you were born to the day you die, which if you did, it would be a miracle. I would actually applaud you. 
If you didn't do that, then you're in deep trouble. You can say, God, I did all these works. I kept the commandments. I've been such a good person, but yet on the side, you've lied and stolen and you are, you know, you did this and that, all these things that the Bible says is an abomination. He says, you got to be judged. That's why sinners will stand before God on the day of judgment and their punishment will be eternity in hell. And that's the reason why Jesus needed to step in to do all the works for us. I know you don't really know too much about Jesus' life, but do you know Jesus actually was working, working, working to keep the law for us? Did you guys know that? And he didn't do it for himself. He did it for us. So Jesus is the one who kept the commandments perfectly. He prayed perfectly. He fasted perfectly. He did everything perfectly that God wanted from a human being. And Jesus said, I'm the substitute and I made it happen for you guys. So that is why he says, don't trust in your righteousness, but in my righteousness. But this righteousness is not something that you can work for. So don't try to take my righteousness and blend it into your righteousness. He says, you have to say to me, I have no righteousness. I'm not putting my trust in my righteousness. I want your righteousness. That's what faith is. And that's how we get saved. That's how God justifies us and makes us innocent before him. Because if we trust in our own righteousness, we're not going to make it. That's why we need the righteousness of Christ. So what I'm basically saying here is that grace and works is not compatible. You cannot say that you live by a gospel of grace, but then you also live by a philosophy of works. It just don't, they don't mix. Of course, we're going to do good works as a Christian. You know, the fruits of the spirit. Of course, we are going to do good works, but we don't do good works to get saved. It happens after salvation. It comes naturally. But some people out there, you know, it, it, I'm not just talking about like people in, in uh, Islam or people in Buddhism or people in, uh, you know, Mormonism. This even happens in the church at times too, where people try to think, I get to heaven by believing in Jesus, but I also need to do all these good works to get saved too. He's saying the two cannot mix. See, I'm going to read another verse from Romans chapter 11, verse 6. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just read it. He says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Do you guys know what grace means? It's not just the name of some lovely gal next door. Grace means unmerited favor giving you something that you didn't deserve, but giving it to you as a gift. Salvation is grace. We cannot earn it by our good works or we cannot mix his grace and say, I need to add to the grace to get saved. He's saying salvation is 100% from God. You either accept it or you reject it. Because he's saying, if you try to mix works in to get saved, then it's no longer grace. Then it's basically a payment, which means that you are required to make a payment to God for your salvation. And if you don't have enough money for that payment, then you're, you're pretty much not going to make it. But Jesus says, in my grace, I've provided enough money for you to pay off the debt and to make it. Isn't that wonderful news? That's really wonderful, guys. I don't know if you're paying attention to this, but this is really what the gospel is. You know, verse 37, he says it also. And no one who puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. So here's another illustration with drink. In ancient times, they would store wine into these skins made out of goat, made out of sheep. And what happens is when they pour new wine in there, because of the gas fermentation, it would expand. But then sometimes what happens is that some people would try to reuse old wine skins and they would pour new wine in and the whole thing would just kind of explode. And then of course, it would all fall into the ground. What a waste. So that's why Jesus says you have to put new wine into new wine skins. It just makes sense. 
So in the same way, Jesus is saying that with the gospel as well. So can you imagine if, let's say, in the 1990s, I know a lot of you guys didn't grow up in the 90s, but Apple computers were slowly coming in in the 90s. And let's say you bought an Apple computer, you loved it so much, and you said, I'm not going to ever part with this Apple computer. I don't want to buy a new one. I had so much memories with this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my new editing system and I'm going to just install some new gigabytes on my old Apple computer and I'm just going to try to work that editing system in my, new, my old Apple computer. Do you think that's actually going to work? No, because that Apple computer doesn't have enough technology to accommodate something like that. So that's why it's better instead of trying to you know, fix and put all these gadgets into the old Apple computer, hey, why don't we just get a brand new Apple computer? from 2023, more than enough to you know, work your editing system or whatever else you need to put in there. That's exactly what Jesus is trying to say in this passage. So once again, Jesus is driving the point home. He does not endorse mixing religions together, thinking that it's okay if I believe in the gospel, but then if I believe in this other thing, I'll be all good. No, he's saying the two cannot mix to produce salvation. Okay, maybe some of you guys think, um, I do believe salvation is by grace, by faith. But then I still do a lot of good works, and I do believe that that's good so that I can, you know, earn God's favor. Of course it is. Of course it is. But don't think that, you know, adding rules to the Bible that's not there is actually going to earn you extra points in heaven. That could be considered legalism if you take it pretty far. So Jesus was basically critiquing them and saying, last verse, he says, No one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says, the old is good enough. See, this proverb tells a really big tragedy with people, not just back then, but even right now. So basically, he's saying, sometimes people are just really content in their old ways. Even though you try to show them something new, something even better, something more necessary, they're like, we don't want that. I'm good with my old ways. I'm happy with it. And it's just like with these Jewish people because Jesus comes onto the scene and there were some people who love him, but then others just didn't appreciate his message. They're saying, nah, Jesus, we're good with our ways. We're good with following these Pharisee rules. We're good with our religion. But Jesus is saying, you got to pay attention because I'm bringing something that's not just better, superior, but also more necessary for your soul. He's saying, I'm bringing the way of eternal life. So once again, the lesson behind point number two, God it does not come to just try to reform something that's old, trying to add on to it, trying to patch something onto it. He's saying, I'm bringing something completely new and you need to change your mindset into believe in that for salvation. So basically, the whole lesson behind this sermon in wrapping this up. So he states the principle and the illustration behind this whole fasting issue to drive home the point that what Christ offers in the gospel is not only superior, but very exclusive. It cannot be combined with other philosophies to produce salvation. So I want to challenge you with this today. If you claim to be living by the new wine, the new wine of Christ, is it actually in a new wineskin or is it in an old damaged wineskin? So what I mean by that is, are you trusting in Christ completely for your salvation? Or is your trust in also in something else for salvation? If this whole time your trust has been in something else, my good works, me being born into a Christian family, Whatever it is, he says, you have to turn from that immediately before it's too late. So today is a day where you can make that right and have a fresh start with Christ by confessing your sin, turning from your sin and turning to Christ and asking for his mercy and he will be merciful to you. So I really do hope that today that's what you're, you're believing in, living by. Because I've been preaching here for almost three years now on this pulpit at this spot. Same message again and again. 
And I don't know if you guys are paying attention or not, but it is very important message because if you were to die tonight and you have not made your life right with God, then that's your soul for all eternity. So that's where I really hope that today, if you still have not turned to Christ in faith, then do so. And God says he will not only save you, but he will also give you a new spirit so that you can love God and adore him. You, you yourself will be new. That is the promise of scripture. Father God, we pray to thank you for this reminder about what salvation is versus what it is not. So we pray, Lord, that we won't get the two confused together, but rather we have to remember that salvation is a gift. It is grace. And we want to live by that grace. And also to tell other people how they can find freedom in Christ, no longer in bondage to traditions that will mislead them to think that that's the way to salvation, but to find freedom in Christ. So we pray, Lord, that we will live by this faith and die by this faith and that we can be all the more joyous knowing, Lord, that you have purchased our salvation with your blood, with your life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.